Hello and welcome into BTN's Take 10 Podcast. This is Alex Rue of BTN.com. We're back with another hoops-themed episode here on the Take 10 Podcast. Although it won't be uh, college hoops so much as it'll be professional basketball because we got a special in-studio guest. Uh, he was stopping in to do some TV work and we were able to borrow him for the podcast as well. If you're a Chicago Bulls fan, especially a Bulls fan uh, that saw the championship teams of the 90s, you'll probably recognize this name. It's Dickie Simpkins. Dickie was a reserve on those Bulls teams. He won three NBA championships with uh, the Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen Bulls and remains friends and uh, close with Michael Jordan to this day. So, you know, Dickie had a lot of great stories from those days uh, and the days before social media and the NBA. Um, and you know, days of a an iconic dynasty, and uh, with one of the most you know interesting and greatest players of all time playing alongside MJ, uh, Dicky was able to, to share some cool anecdotes um, before discussing uh, some other interesting stories about his professional career once he moved on uh, from the NBA and played overseas and uh, got into scouting and coaching as well. So had Dicky Simpkins in studio for about 20 minutes. Uh, great to meet him and and chat with him always great to have uh nba players on because uh, just with how accessible the league is these days and um you get someone on that played when the league was less accessible it's always fun to uh you know pull back the curtain a little bit so that discussion with dickie's coming right up after that we have a another call for the culture segment if you've been listening lately we introduced a new segment with our producer colleen degnan who uh, brings pop culture to the pod she lets us know what's going on uh, in the intersection of sports, entertainment, music, movies, all that good stuff. We talk some Grammys, talk some uh, Valentine's Day, since this was recorded on Valentine's Day, and then connect it to Big Ten, and uh, talk some Netflix as well. So that's all coming right up. Just a quick reminder before we get to those two interviews, uh, subscribe to the podcast if you are just streaming right now and have not done so yet. We can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Podbean, and on Big Ten Network YouTube channel as well. So definitely hit subscribe and you will not miss an episode. All right, first up, it is Dickie Simpkins, as I said at the top of the show, former Chicago Bull, three-time NBA champ, and current broadcaster for Fox Sports 1, calls college basketball, mostly Big East, um, and also is a scout and youth coach in the AU scene. So... Without further ado, let's get to uh, the main interview of this show. It's Dickie Simpkins, and it starts right now. All right, very pleased to be joined by a three-time NBA champion, NBA scout, and college basketball analyst for FS1. It's Dickie Simpkins. Mr. Simpkins, how are you, sir? I'm good. Real good. Glad to be on this show. Yeah, and you're uh, back in Chicago where you won those three NBA titles uh, you do not live here, but I assume it's, it's good to be back, right? Oh, it's always good to be back in Chicago. I love being here. I spent 16 years. I want to say I lived here for 16 years. I love Chicago. You know, after a while, you got to figure out <laughs> how long you want to keep dealing with the weather. So I've gone south now. Yeah, it's been uh, kind of crazy around here. I don't blame you for going south one bit. Uh, but I, when I was doing a little bit of research for this interview, I was looking back at footage of your Chicago Bulls days, and one of the first things that popped up on YouTube, and I heard you talking about it on the show when you were in our TV studio just now, was uh, your first career three-pointer was assisted on by none other than Michael Jordan. Can you tell me about that story and why it was kind of a unique play? Yeah, it's funny. I always tell that story. Um, you know, it just it just organically, I guess, happened that the sh- the clock was running down for the half, we were playing the San Antonio Spurs at the United Center. MJ happened to grab the rebound and thrust out in transition as the clock's running down to halftime. Scottie Pippen was on the left side. I was on the right side. MJ was coming down the middle. And I, I always say to people, hey, first option is obviously MJ. First, second, third, fourth option is MJ. And then the next option is Scottie Pippen. And I'm probably a 15th or 20th option if it <laughs> if all fails, you know. And so he's dribbling down. He looks over at Scotty, doesn't pass it to him. He doesn't take the shot and ends up flinging a pass to me as the clock's running down. I go off the one-legger for a three-point shot that goes off the glass and then right at the buzzer. And I just keep running out to the locker room as I make the shot like I do this all the time. 
And then when everybody came in the locker room, they were laughing, and I just looked at MJ and said, hey, you made the right decision. <laughs> well, in the broadcast, the announcer said that MJ, as he was walking off the court, was saying, like, give me my assist or something like that. Did you hear that at all? I did hear that. I did hear that. When he came in the locker room, I gave, I gave him his credit for his assist. <laughs> was he serious or joking? Because I feel like a guy like MJ, you know, that competitiveness, he probably was like, Half joking, if that. No, nah, he 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 was. Uh, it was just. It was kind of funny. He was he was smiling, coming to the locker room, laughing about how, how I made the shot and just kept on running out <laughs> to the locker room. That's the Bo Jackson, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you always got to act like this is what you do on a regular basis. <laughs> right. So, you know, obviously there were some plenty of light moments in that locker room. Um, but I'm curious as a, as a Bulls fan who is not old enough to remember really watching those uh, '90s Bulls in the dynasty. What was that locker room like? Because I hear the stories like, you know, Steve Kerr is getting punched and MJ and, and Scotty are competitive. What was that locker room like just as a, as a member of that team? Well, um, it was always competitive. I mean, MJ brought a, brought a high level and intense competitive environment. So it was always competitive. Um, if you weren't competing, you know, MJ was going to call you out. Uh, we had some, some moments of... You know, where it got a little scrappy. But for the most part, it wasn't a lot of moments like that. Um, when M- when Phil wanted the practice to really go to another level, he would put Scotty on one team versus MJ, and they would guard each other. And we didn't have too many of those kind of practices, but when we, when we would have them, that was probably the highest intense practice. Because, you know, now us as teammates, we get to see – MJ go at Pip and see what Pip does as far as going at MJ and then you know kind of everybody kind of fall in and do their part but you know we had the little incident with Steve Kerr which I'm sure is public knowledge now and that was just one of those days um, that practice got a little tense. Steve stood up for himself and it just it just got to that moment but for the most part the locker room was just super professional you got to keep in mind I was in a locker room with MJ, I was in the locker room with top 50 greatest players that ever played a game, Hall of Famers, and just I was the youngest guy of a veteran team. So I was able to see a professional environment from day one. And so that was pretty much how the locker room was. And this is before social media, before all the mm-hmm. access that we get now to NBA players, before all the visibility. What was the, I guess, scene like, you know, traveling with the Bulls, um, to road games, was it like being a member of the Beatles? Was it a circus, like you know, game in, game out, or were you guys able to settle into a routine like during the regular season? Did it calm down ever? Well, it never calmed down, and it was a circus. It was you know like being on a you know a rock band tour. It never calmed down. But again, the fact that all the guys were older guys and had been in the NBA for a while and super professional. We were able to manage the environment, but it was it was you know you had your MJ part of all the circus you know, um, which is a big part of him being the most popular player and best player in the game. You had your Dennis Rodman piece, which that was a whole another <laughs> dynamic of what we had going on, and it, and and Dennis had his way of even though it wasn't social media at that time, it still was a lot of attention put to. <laughs> D Rod's, you know, lifestyle right. and how he approached his thing. So that was a whole another dynamic that brought on more circus uh, type atmosphere. Um, and obviously, we had Scotty, who was a who was a top player, top fifty player. So um, we would get in the hotels late at night. I mean, we could get in. I remember, I remember flying in to Denver. We didn't get in until like three in the morning or two thirty in the morning, and the hotels packed full. I mean, you have people out there with their little kids so it never calmed down it never calmed down one bit what are some differences that you see between the NBA the 90s and the NBA today whether it's you know the competitiveness of the players or the style of play I'm sure you notice a lot just as an observer now um, if you could elaborate on that um, I, do, I just think when I came in in the 90s again it was more veteran players you know not a lot of not a lot of young guys coming to the NBA. You either had you had veteran college players coming into the NBA, and the NBA was filled with veteran players. It wasn't a lot of young. So after my first couple of years, 
that's when the transition started with younger players starting to leave school much earlier. So I would say the the whole professional maturity part of this game was at a higher level in the 90s than I see now. I think because and it's just, and it's what it is. I mean, kids coming in younger, there's no way you could be that mature for the next level and you only play one year of college sure. basketball. Yeah. No way. So that's a big piece that stands out. I think uh, I think the physicality of the game is is definitely different, and and that's some because of how the generation is being taught to play, but also that has something to do with the change of the game. Also, for the game to be faster, more points. So it's a combination of both those things, where it's a little different. Whereas in the '90s, it was a little bit more physical and grimier, grinded out type games. So those are the things that kind of stand out for the most part of the differences. And then obviously the social media aspect is a major difference. And, you know, I don't know what would have happened if we had social media in the 90s. I mean, that social media is a whole other beast and how to manage that. I think it's just brought the league closer together. You know, you got players teaming up, players kind of scheming on, uh, either you know forming a super team or maybe going through back channels as we've seen with uh, players sharing agents and stuff. You know, like I, I just feel like today you see more of the, um, I guess friendships that you that you wouldn't have seen where in the '90s guys were going at each other, '80s guys were going at each other, as opposed to you know Kevin Durant. As using him as an example. I mean, I'm for, all for for player freedom and all that and, and the right to do what they want and free agency but you know Kevin Durant leaving the Thunder and teaming up with with the Warriors who he just lost to I, I just feel like I don't know from an observer that that's a part of the game that's changed I don't know if you agree with that no I agree with that I mean that's a general that's a generational change right there that's a new millennium change um, that the players nowadays are looking to team up with their buddies or team up with their friends or team up with who they think they can put a super team together. I mean, I get it. You have the ability to do that, then go do it. If that increases your chances to win a championship, then I get it. I understand. I think I think anybody in life, the thing where I think people get lost, if we were looking outside of basketball, if we were looking at a job or a corporation and somebody's working at a company and, you know, they're going to look at their life the same way. Hey, I'm, I might need to go work at such and such company with my buddies because they are killing it as far as a corporation and profits and things like that, and he may leave one company to go to the other. I get it. Generation I came up in, you're right. It was different. Guys wanted to play against guys, and even if you were friends, you wanted to compete very hard against your buddy. And... uh and, and you had a different mentality towards not teaming up. I want to prove that I can beat this guy. So it was a different mentality. I can't say that the new mentality is right or wrong. You have the ability to do it. I get it. You want to enhance your you want to enhance your percentages to win. I understand. And you can't say the '90s was um, right or wrong. Guys just had an old school mentality. Yeah, well said. I think I agree with you there. I'm, I've always been kind of conflicted about it, but I can definitely see. Both sides. And, and Dickie, you had a long pro career post-NBA. Uh, you didn't hang him up until uh, 2006 or so. So after your time in the league, how many leagues, countries, teams did you did you play for uh, throughout your, your lengthy career? Well, I was blessed to be able to continue to play professional. I played in a lot of different countries between Lithuania, Russia, Greece, Spain, Philippines, Germany. Um, played in a lot of different places and and uh, I really, when I look at it, I'm happy that I did because I got an experience of a lifetime. I don't know if I didn't play basketball, would, would I've been in all these different places and experienced the cultures and you know these different countries. I don't know. So my kids got an opportunity to experience some of these things too. So I played in a lot of different places and, and you know enjoyed the experience and. Wouldn't, wouldn't change it for anything else. And those experiences are obviously lasting in my mind and, and the way I move around in life. You know, those things are lasting forever. So, and then, you know, had some, got to see a lot of different things. You know, I had to, 
deal with some 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 things a lot of things that were good a lot of things that were challenging like travel travel was challenging in Europe always a challenge I could go you know it'd be a travel day we could be on a train bus and a plane really like <laughs> train planes and automobiles like the movie it was really like that and it could be long days and then you know just adjusting to some of the cultures and the cultural foods could be difficult at times but you know, you start to get used to it if you're open-minded. But um, all in all, unbelievable experience playing internationally in all the places that I did. Yeah, and when I talked to, to guys who played overseas and, and bounced around uh, quite a bit, guys like Robbie Hummel, Stephen Bardo, who have been to corners of the world to play basketball, I always love uh, asking if there are any stories um, about, you know, things that you probably wouldn't see in basketball in the United States. Usually, like, there's some nonsense that goes on, like whether it's – guys not getting paid or referees that are crooked or, or players uh, interacting with fans in, in different ways. Do you have any favorite wild stories from playing overseas um, in a sense that, you know, you might not see every day playing stateside? Well, when I first went over, the interesting thing is you won't see people smoking cigarettes at a game. So that was that was pretty interesting, uh, being in an arena. My first place I played was Greece. And to be in an arena where people are smoking cigarettes was pretty interesting, but while also having a protective cover over your bench was pretty interesting because the fans threw things at the opposing team and threw things on the court. So that was pretty dangerous. I mean, you, you see some games here in the States in college where fan, college fans or fans will throw stuff on the court, but... In Europe, you could seriously get injured, so that was that was interesting and an adjustment. Um, I never really had major issues, and one thing for me, which was uh, fortunate for me, I had played in the NBA for a while. So it's like if you had played in the NBA and then you transition to Europe, you kind of get treated a little. You get treated differently because they don't want to mess up. They don't want to mess up the vibe uh, and. People find out that they don't treat former NBA players or guys that played in the NBA well. So I didn't have major issues because I got treated pretty good in all these countries. But definitely the smoking, the protective um, benches. And then I would say the one thing that really stood out was Russia. Being in Russia, driving in Russia, and being stopped all the time by the Russian police. And... And and that was pretty interesting, and they would speak Russian to me and <laughs> try to get rubles from me for whatever reason, which I don't know. That was um, that was different. That was different the way that went about. So, other than that, I never had any major issues or stories. I, I I'll say this last one: we're I'm playing in Russia. We go we're going to play in Saint Petersburg. We get on this plane, and the plane we get on. <laughs> We get on the plane. As I'm getting on the plane, because we, we're, we're loading up from the back, the plane has the parachute hookup the, for jumping out in the parachutes and stuff. And it, I had never been on a plane that had the actual hookup for people to jump out the plane in the parachutes. And I was like, what, can, what are we doing here? And I was expecting to be handed a parachute by the flight attendant before we took off. So that was... That was pretty different. And that particular day, I had my parent. I mean, I had my uh, family with me traveling. My wife and kids traveling with me to Russia to Saint Petersburg. So that was a little, that was a little scary. You're a braver man than I. Because if I see a parachute in a plane, I'm not sure I'm, I'm <laughs> letting that thing take off with me on it. <laughs> That's great, though. Uh, uh, moving on now to your post basketball career. Uh, how do you get involved? Obviously, you're as I said at the top. You're a broadcaster for uh, Fox now, and you uh, have some basketball duties on the administrative side and the NBA as well. How did you get involved in scouting and broadcasting? How do you uh, balance those responsibilities and coaching too, um, running an AAU program here in Chicago? Well, as I was winding down my basketball career and I felt like it was it was time to shut it down, I had already kind of put a list together of things that either I wanted to do or I felt like I was capable of doing. And um, I had a long list of from coaching to training to front office to TV to real estate to bartender I had all kinds of stuff now so I was like and then I and then I was like going and I went to real estate class like I went to an accelerated real estate class one week class and got my real estate license 
And then they were offering a broker's license with a two-week real estate class, so I went and did that. So I was doing these things, but I tapped into my relationships. But before I did that, I started this basketball program to help kids uh, play on the circuit, get college opportunities. It's still going. Um, the guys that I have running the program have done an excellent job with it. It's in the north suburbs of Chicago. So that's how I, that was the first thing I started. And then I moved from there, um, knowing Doris Burke. I've been knowing Doris Burke for a long time. And her former husband was our SID at Providence College. So I knew Doris when she first was in TV. And she was working for Nesson on the uh, Northeast. And so I called Doris up, told her I was trying to get into TV, and she pointed me in the right direction and helped me, connected me with the right people, and then it went from there. Um, and then while I was doing TV, I got a call from MJ. MJ called me one day, uh, actually when I was going to do an Illinois game, I was going to do an Illinois game, he called me on the phone and said, hey, um, we're looking to try to bring you on board. I want to bring you on board to do some things and, and work up here in the front office, do some scouting, and then grow from there. So I was happy to get that call. Obviously, I'm, you know, I have a great relationship with MJ. and So when he gave me that call, I flew down, we met, and then, um, that's when working with the NBA team started. And you, you talked about your program here in the Chicagoland area, and you've had some great players come through that program to, to go on and play college and uh, – and in the NBA, and, and I'm sure there's some notable ones still still playing right now. Uh, I mean, Admiral Schofield's one on Tennessee, who's on a national title contender. Uh, can you get into your, inter- I guess, your experience with him, and maybe some other guys that listeners might recognize that have uh, come through your ranks? Well, the first thing about my program, what the, the thing that I thrive off of was I built the program on finding hidden gems, finding sleepers, finding people that finding players that had talent that nobody knew about. Or they were players that played at different places, but people overlooked them. So my first player that I came across was Brandon Paul, who played at Illinois, had an unbelievable career at Illinois, played with the San Antonio Spurs last year, has played in Europe, playing in China right now. He will definitely be back in the NBA. But when I built this environment and culture, the hidden gem type of players, which you got to kind of find, they gravitated to that. They saw the success of what was happening with the kids coming through the program, and Brandon Paul was one of the first guys. And then um, uh, Rick Brunson called me one day. Jalen Brunson played in my program, and then I, I was fortunate enough to have the cousin of Javon Carter playing. He was older, and then all of a sudden, Javon Carter's dad brought him to our program one day when he was in the seventh grade, and it just went from there. And obviously, Javon Carter got drafted number 32 in the draft last year, playing for the Memphis Grizzlies. Um, Evan Boudreaux, who was played at Lake Forest High School, was Ivy League Rookie of the Year, now is transferred to Purdue and is playing at Purdue. And then, like you mentioned, Admiral Schofield, obviously – is having an unbelievable college career, college season. They're number one in the country at Tennessee. But those guys all just, they saw the blueprint. They worked. They understood. And they trusted in me guiding them. And I still got them today. I mean, it's like it's like a 24-7 job. So, and, and I love it to be able. I was blessed with some abilities, talent, and I wanted to be able to give it and help other guys so those are some of the names of guys that stand out yeah and those guys you mentioned I mean they fit that bill of being undervalued and then blowing up once they hit the college scene I mean I I see guys like Javon Carter Admiral Schofield those guys killing it across college basketball and I'm like how did the University of Illinois you know get knock it on them sooner so you know Brandon Paul obviously is an example where they they were able to to land land him but uh yeah those are those are Great examples. Um, Dickie, before I let you go, i got to ask, because I know it's a theme of your broadcasts, um, what's the deal with the bitmojis? How did this get involved in, in your broadcasts? And, and I don't watch a lot of Big East basketball. I've seen yeah. a couple of your Big Ten broadcasts, but tell me how uh, the bitmoji got involved in, in your college basketball broadcast. Well, I'm always trying to think of some creative stuff for TV or for my own brand or just stuff that's fun for TV. And I, I think one day I was uh, – 
I was looking at my phone and I was able to create or find some basketball emojis on my phone. So I kind of like sent it to the Fox people and said, hey, I want to use these. And, and obviously they said I wouldn't be able to use those from a legal standpoint. So I was like, oh, man. So what they did, which I appreciate, appreciate Fox for doing, is they went in and created and made my own bitmojis for the, for the network. And uh, I joke about it because they, they whenever I'm doing a game, the producers say, they produ- I, I tell the producers that they have to get my bitmojis out the vault. They keep my bitmojis in the <laughs> vault in L.A. <laughs> so that's how it came about. And, it, and, and some of the things I say on TV kind of, we kind of put them all together. You know, I, I say this hashtag splash thing because it's, you know, we're in the social media world. And uh, I was having this back to the lab segment I was doing where I would diagram and teach them, teach something to happen in the game. So that's how I kind of formulated. And the producer, Mark Smith, for Fox TV, was the one who kind of spearheaded the creation of these Bitmojis. And I appreciate him to the fullest. So I have to credit him for motivating the process with a bit emoji. So they've been fun, man. They've been All fun. Right. Staying ahead of the social media curve. I love it. That's all I got for you, Dickie. Thanks so much for your time. Really uh, enjoyed hearing about, you know, your playing days, especially as a Bulls fan. That's uh that's cool to hear. And uh, keep up the good work. We'll be following your broadcasting and uh you know, as college basketball moves along here, we'll we'll uh we'll all be watching. So appreciate your time. Man, I appreciate you having me on, man. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks once again to Mr. Simpkins for joining me. Cool to uh, chat with him, like I like I said, and it was funny just shaking his hand. I think uh, I could fit three of my hands into his. You know, he's got that NBA player handshake. <laughs> you know, guy who's like six seven, six eight, just towers over you. So uh, awesome to sit down with him, and appreciate him giving some of his time up, uh, especially after doing a TV show here in studio. Very generous to come on the pod. All right, now we'll get to. So I explained at the top our call for the culture segment. We kick it over to our producer, Colleen Degnan, who will introduce us to the hottest pop culture topics of the day and how they intersect with Big Ten and uh, you know, all around sports in general. So toss it now. Back to the studio. It's Colleen Degnan in Call for the Culture. All right, we're back with our third call for the culture segment i almost lost count we're on that number three colleen welcome back to the lab how's it going um it's going well happy valentine's day happy valentine's day to you we're gonna get into uh some valentine's day themed stuff here in just a second but first we gotta bring up the elephant in the room um things were a little tense when i walked into the office earlier this week uh you seem kind of mad at me I don't know why, because I don't think I did anything wrong. So apparently you were off the love train early this week when I ran into you on Sunday in public in Lincoln Park. I was getting lunch with one of my girlfriends, and she recognized you, you know, celebrity on the streets. So I went outside to say hello, and somebody acted as if they did not know me. Okay, let me tell my side of the story real quick, just to, uh, you know, straighten it out for the listener so they don't think I'm a bad guy. One... I was leaving the restaurant, and I was with two friends, and it was snowing. I get across. I'm, I'm in the middle of crossing a uh, busy street, you know, in Chicago, how they have kind of the five-way intersections. And I hear someone who turned out to be you calling my name. And I turn around, and you have a hood on, a hat on. I can literally only see your mouth from across the street. It's snowing. And I, another point, you don't live in this neighborhood. You live... <laughs> far away so i did not expect it to be you excuses excuses yeah. and so you know i i'm like who is that who is that and when you finally say it's colleen i'm already like three quarters away across the street I'm like oh hey and then i carry on with my day and you go back to have your lunch really it was a considerate thing for me to do because i let you get back to your meal in your afternoon i knew i was going to see that like the day later at work i don't think it's a big deal i mean you hear me talk all day long you would have think that would have been recognizable enough for you but yeah. That's okay. I'm a little bit more cheery she, when it she comes to... She made a big to... stink about it in the office and, and basically... <laughs> He's now sullied, the villain. ...sullied my name to <laughs> our entire uh, department. So um, I had to hear about that coming to the office. But we'll move past it. It is Valentine's Day. And with it being Valentine's Day, um, you know, we obviously had to make some Big Ten friendly content. 
to put out on the social medias for all our fans. So this is kind of a thing we've been doing the last couple of years. It's not unique at all, but it's our own spin on things. It's making the little Valentine's Day cards themed to each team. So, Colleen, I don't think you've seen many of these yet. We kind of made them and are rolling them out today. I'm going to read some of the uh, cards to you, and I want to get your reactions. Maybe pick a couple that are your amazing favorites. Some are corny. Some are a little more clever. I feel like I'll appreciate this because I'm in the minority when I say I love Valentine's Day. Yeah, Valentine's Day, you know, it's... It is, I, I've been on both sides of it, you know, the single side and the, the dating side. And It doesn't mean that. Just, it's just a day of love. You don't have to distinguish. I know, I'm, just, I'm just trying to distinguish because, you know, as a guy, it's a lot less expensive when you're on oh one side gosh. of it than the other. So You're ridiculous. Uh, okay. It's just a day to be more loving than you normally are to anybody in your life. Great. And, you know, I like it because my mom gets me every year, oh regardless, gosh. you know, some candy and some gift cards. You're and, the you know. Scrooge of St. Uh, Valentine. No, no. Okay, so I'm going to read these uh, Big Ten-themed uh, Valentine's, and you know, when there's 14 of them, some are better than others. I'll let you be the judge. All right, we're gonna go out in team order for some of these. I don't know, know what order really these are displayed on my computer screen, but first one are Fighting Illini of Illinois. It's a picture of Io DeSumo, and it says, Io, wanna be my Valentine. Oh, yeah, I don't, that, hey, oh, yes. All right, you like that? I would one? say yes. This is the obvious one coming up Indiana, um, with their star freshman Romeo Langford. It's pretty simple. It's, will you be my Juliet? <laughs> okay, you had to do that. That one, that was like a walk in the park. Okay, I'm not going to read every single one, but there's a couple that are obvious that I have to I have to run across you here. Amir Coffee on Minnesota. Let's get coffee. You know, that's oh, just simple. Oh, wait my that. heart. You know I pound like four cups a day at the least. Yeah, and, you know, everybody, who doesn't love coffee in their in their early 20s? I think all my friends drink it, even if they, you know, they hate it. It's kind of a necessity. So that's a good one. Um... I think I really like this one, especially considering Nebraska had a big win Wednesday night. It's Tim Miles, and it's a million pictures of Tim Miles, and it says, I would walk a thousand miles, for, you know. Okay, this soft. has dual appreciation in my heart, not okay. only because I have a very big soft spot for Tim Miles and him getting choked up in his press conference last week is still... And last night, too. Did you see that? Yes, he was, yeah. again, he is a great coach, I think. I mean, maybe their record doesn't say so, but personality-wise and speaking to his character, huge fan. And bonus, back in the day of elementary school, me and some of my friends did sing Vanessa Carlton's a thousand miles for the um, song festival. So, love that one. Okay, I think that was one of the better ones. I'm gonna read one more. This one's less clever. It's been done, but you know, it, it was so obvious we had to do it. It's Ethan Happ. You make me so happy. I think Wisconsin did the same thing. It, this is your hometown team, or your, your college team, Judge. Much appreciation for Happ, but um, yes, it seems a little bit. It's been done before, but I still appreciate it. All right. Well, like I said, there's 14. They can't all be great. <laughs> you know, we, we nailed most of them. So, you know, we like to have a little fun around here on Valentine's Day. Um, everyone's in the spirit. The building's I mean, got candy in the lobby. It's, you know. I would say everyone is not in the spirit. You are not in any pink or red to every listener out there. <laughs> I'm exposing Alex Rowe. All right. Well, that's fine. You know, I, I can live with that if, if that's the worst, uh, worst thing about this Valentine's Day. Moving on. We have to talk about um, a another recent pop culture event. Our, our first call for the culture. We got into the awards show theme, and I guess I never really thought about it. But yeah, this is awards season. We're and, still trucking along. And yeah, with this past weekend, the Grammys going on. They were incredible. Alicia Keys as host. See, I don't usually watch the Grammys. Why? I just don't have like a huge interest in award shows. But this weekend, I sat down. And I watched most of the Grammys. Are you proud? I'm really impressed. I, I I obviously was tuned in, and Alicia Keys' host, I thought, did an incredible job. She's iconic and has such good taste in everything across the board, from all of her outfits, her song selections. I don't know how much she actually has a say in this, but her dual piano performance, amazing. Who was your favorite performer? Well, I agree with you on Alicia Keys because I'd never seen her host an award show before, but she had a, a way of putting the viewer at ease and the audience at ease and all at once in a way that I think is, is really hard to do, especially if you're trying to command a room. Again, I you know, I, I don't have a lot to compare it to because I'm not tuning into this every year, but she's so calm. She did a great job. Um, let's think, who who won some awards? Like I know I'm out of touch with music when these awards 
come up and I haven't heard of like 75% of the performers or the winners. Well, I think more so, can we break down the categories? What is the difference between best record, between best song, between best rookie, between best up and coming? Yeah, that's another, well, that's a thing that I was confused about watching. They would roll these back-to-back-to-back awards out and it'd be like best record, best album, best song, and some of these like albums and songs are the same thing. There's like, it's, like the same songs in the categories, and then I don't even know if we had the same winners or not. But that I was mean, that's, pro- that's part of the viewing problem for me is I don't know like what's going on. Maybe some viewers feel the same that are more musically inclined to when they're watching a sports game. And like, well, what's the difference between a field goal percentage, between like behind the arc, between you know like different stats for different people? That is true. I mean, categories in sports can get. <laughs> splitting hairs real quick and so we could be sounding incredibly yeah, ignorant I, I, right I'm, now. I'm sure I, I mean I am ignorant when it comes to music but um I mean I gotta give a shout out to my man Drake you he do won, love him I do love Drake I'm a Drake stan as I've made very clear he won uh, God's Plan won one of those aforementioned categories I think it was best album reg- song record I don't know just one- so everybody knows Alex would not stop singing Drake's latest yeah. album for the better portion of 2018 guilty and God's Plan, which won. I, I would not stop singing that. I still didn't stop singing it. Um, Well-deserved. Shout out to my man, Drake. I'm sorry they cut you off, bro, at the uh, uh, acceptance speech because he was kind of riffing on the selection process or, like, how awards don't mean anything. The Grammys was like, this is not good. And he was going on long, and so the music started playing, and they went to commercial. Don't let them silence you, Drake. Uh, you know, you're a legend. And speaking of, of Drake, I know you... Happy 10 years yeah. to your first album, Drake. So far gone. How did you know that was coming up? I didn't even realize. I'm in on the culture, Okay. obviously. Okay, have you been a Drake fan for 10 years? Or? <laughs> I don't think I've been a, a very loyal Drake fan or devout nearly as much as you, but best I ever had is is, is a classic. Yeah, I, I remember when, when that song came out, and it was a banger, and luckily it didn't go the way of many other one-hit wonders that I listened to when I was in middle school. So, Also, and Drake is so relevant, I feel like, with all of our sports referendums. He... He's yes. very in on all of his it's teams. Actually, it's actually a perfect in, uh, transition into All-Star Weekend because... Exciting! Drake was such a big part of All-Star Weekend when they were in Toronto a few years ago. Um, NBA All-Star Weekend is interesting because it's really the only thing going on right now besides college basketball. And it kind of takes over the middle of the, that weekend in the middle of February. And it's more of a, a you know celebrity and athlete mixer than anything like the actual basketball I think is, is more and more receded into a relevancy really as it's all been kind of a branded celebrity experience I don't know how you consume it or, or now you know as a new Blazers fan if you're going to watch more this year or what I mean Dame got got chosen for LeBron's squad so I'll definitely be tuning in to support him although is he I, a Blazers only all-star yes okay yes but I thought the whole process of how they chose the teams and they um televised it was really really good and entertaining yeah i I kind of forgotten they did that honestly that they the last couple years they've been choosing the captains this year it's lebron and uh Giannis and the kumpo are the two captains and they choose teams and it's not east versus west anymore like i'd forget like that's how irrelevant the basketball's gotten that i forgot (laughs) that they choose the teams now well this is like bringing back like horror stories of middle school (laughs) pe class like you don't want to get last chosen but then you're still like the last chosen of the most elite players i wouldn't know anything about being last chosen. oh Um, okay okay (laughs) but again like i feel like i'll tune in you know every year for a few minutes and everyone's kind of too cool to play now in in the all-star game nobody really goes hard unless you somehow stumble into the fourth quarter and it's like 155 to 154 and there the competitiveness in these guys comes out because again it's such a you know it's such an opportunity to be seen no one wants to be seen playing defense in the all-star game really the the only thing that gets people competitive and hype is Saturday night when the three-point contest and the dunk contest are going on. But even the dunk contest has been changed well, so many times. Like it's I been, know, the rules are very flexible. The format's been, yeah. been tweaked so many times that I can't even keep up with that. I mean, we at least have Miles Bridges is playing or participating. Yeah, he is participating. So we have a Big Ten rep. I, I can't remember the last time a Big Ten rep's been in the do dunk you, contest. Do you think he has contention? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm looking at the, the lineup here. So it's Miles Bridges... John Collins from Atlanta, who I'm only vaguely familiar with. Hamadou Diallo uh, on the Thunder, who also I don't know much about. I think he was in like, Kansas. And then Dennis Smith Jr., who I actually saw play in person when he was on NC State a couple years ago. Um, NC State visited Illinois, and I went to that game. And Illinois actually won that game. Dennis Smith Jr. did not do much. So, 
Uh, Dennis Smith, the new 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 York Nick, uh, was recently traded. He's going to be like kind of the fan favorite because he's like six foot tall, if that, maybe in heels. Um, but I mean, you know, in we've, heels. We've both we've both been around for Miles Bridges' uh, performance. I'm sure you know. I'm sure you have a good idea of his talents, and I'm sure you'll be rooting for him. Yeah, it'll just be, I think it'll be an interesting weekend, and like you said, we're in a little bit of a lull across, but not so much of a lull in the Big Ten. I mean, the race right now for the title yeah, it's, is it's, nuts. It is nuts, and I think your Badgers now are on the outside looking in. They still have a, a okay. chance, but, you know, just with, with Maryland and Michigan, Michigan State, and Purdue now a bunch at the top, it's going to be nuts. I, have you been – so so – I'm here most nights watching the games. What is your game day viewing habits? Like, do you take in after you work a nine to five here? Do you go home and flip on Big Ten, or do you save your viewing energy for the Blazers? <laughs> I definitely turn on Big Ten, um, mostly because right now it is incredibly interesting. In every game, you never know what's going to happen and how it's going to affect your team. Um, what are so, your thoughts on your team, though, the Badgers right now? I mean, last night, tough loss two nights ago to Michigan State. Tough loss on. Uh, we obviously need to work on some consistency at the free throw line. Um, so maybe if we can figure that out and lessen the turnovers. I, we're definitely going to make the tournament this year, which is going to be amazing because last year was super disappointing. But It's unprecedented, really. I mean, in your it, lifetime. In my life, in my, especially in my lifetime and especially in my years at Wisconsin. So I I think we're, we're still in, very much have a shot. Well, I here's, here's what's interesting. I feel like a, a Wisconsin basketball expert because, as you know, um, one of our friends and coworkers sits next to us, and he's also a producer of the show, Wes White, will talk in depth about the Badgers uh, quite often in the office. And, and we actually kind of uncovered a stat about Wisconsin uh, while we were you know, discussing their tendencies yesterday. We all know that Wisconsin this year is a good three-point shooting team, but they're actually, I think, third in the country in percentage um, shooting threes. And... Actually, it's Wisconsin is top 15 in the country in three-point percentage. They're shooting 39%, which is very good. But I was looking deeper into the, uh, the Ken Palm stats, and Wisconsin is near the bottom in the ranks in the country in their share of three-pointers relative to their total field goals taken. So they make a high percentage of their threes. They're just not taking a lot of threes. And it makes total sense, right? We have our star boy, Ethan Happ. Yeah, Happ is a great player, one of the best players in the Big Ten, first team all Big Ten. Breaking, broken so many records. Yeah, he, he's he's amazing. It's just the nature of how Wisconsin plays. They run the offense through Happ, and they're just not going to get a lot of three-point shots because he doesn't shoot threes, and you know he, he's taking a lot of, of those two-pointers. So I just thought that was interesting. You know, I like trying to learn more about the statistical side of basketball. And since our co-worker you know is uh always eager to talk big 10 hoops and you are as well especially with wisconsin um i was able to you know kind of dig in and now i feel smart for, for digging that up so you're love welcome. the stats you should new stat every week we're yep. instating that right now all right we'll, we'll make that a, a regular segment we'll have to think of a catchy name so that's, that's homework for next week all right so when you're not watching big 10 hoops at night when you're not watching the blazers <laughs> right. we have to talk about this because this is like again it's february everyone's inside it's you know and in perfect tune with Valentine's yeah, Day. Yeah, it's Netflix. And, <laughs> it's Netflix season. It's Netflix and chill season. Well, no, more so. There's a weird phenomenon sweeping the streaming nation with psychos and serial killers and true crime right now. Okay, I I'm gonna argue that it's always been like that because like Criminal Minds has been on for like 20. Years. Okay, but yes. yes, you're right. Netflix though, it's streaming. like streaming. That's why I'm emphasis streaming. You're right. Okay, elaborate. Okay, so right now, well. A lot of people, I'm not going to generalize because maybe not everyone shares an appreciation for Penn Badgley, has been talking about you. Have you seen this? I've not seen you. What's it about? I've heard that it's like crazy. Okay. So it's really funny because the character, Joe, who Penn Badgley plays, who Penn Badgley played Dan Humphrey on Gossip Girl, Mm -hmm. is this manager of a bookstore and he becomes obsessed with this recent NY grad, Beck. And she, and he he will do everything it takes like for stalker. Yes, okay. for her to fall in love with him. Okay, and so we've got the crazy in that show. So that's the that's the one crazy, and that's it. Sh- it started on Lifetime, and then Netflix picked it up, and it just caught fire. Yeah, and it is very addicting. It's insane. You're constantly thinking what's going to happen, but then so not only do you have maybe like a conglomeracy of people that appreciated him from Gossip Girl, then you have the Ted Bundy 
documentary right. series that also released Isn't on Isn't there, Netflix. like, multiple Ted Bundy things okay. coming out right now? Well, exactly. So there, um, a movie that just went through Sundance was The Conversations with the Killer, the Ted Bundy tapes. Right. And Zac Efron stars in that. So that's obviously a huge appeal as well because they're kind of using... Glorifying him a little bit. Uh, okay, so I understand what you're about to say. But these are just incredibly interesting. Well, you is not real. But the Ted Bundy docs, and then another one that's sweeping Netflix right now, abducted in plain sight. Yeah, that one is what I'm seeing on social media all over the place. Like, you know, the our competitor our competitor podcast, hard my take, you know, we're up there top friends, trade friends. blows with them, you know, friendly <laughs> competitor. They've brought it up. That's what kind of brought it to my attention. And apparently, you know, it's crazy enough that it's like going viral. On social media so what's going on well it just doesn't make sense that one's ridiculous because that's also true it's it follows this it, t- it tells the story of this young girl jan and was pretty much her parents i don't know if they were blissfully ignorant living under a rock who knows but her neighbor pretty much kidnaps her twice in her life okay and and it's just this ridiculous story unveiling what happened i don't want to give too much away because obviously people you should all watch it's very interesting well i think like the success of making a murderer you know obviously showed that it could be that try true crime could become a phenomenon on netflix just like kind of had on, on cable tv and I, I've never really been that into, like, true crime stuff. I know a lot of people are. The Ted Bundy stuff is, is weird because, like, you know, obviously you know what he did and got away with for such a long time. And then, you know, all of a sudden you have Zac Efron, Zac Efron playing you in a movie. And it's like it, I, I see the argument where it would be, like, you know, glorifying this guy. Um, well, the most sex I, thing I, I, just, I, I just don't think, like um, – you know he's all all that interesting. I don't know, like, I, but I all that interesting. I'm gonna, Do you know anything? He just, he just killed people. Like, you know what I mean? Thir- over thirty women. Yes, we, it's oh not anything God. to like be. I don't think that's anything to be like celebrated. Those ones. Not saying. celebrated, but the whole idea is that like while this was going on too, like he completely was like I'm innocent, and so many people believed him because of his appeal. Right. He was charming. He's charismatic. He had a career. I get it. I watched. I will say I watched Dexter, and I really liked that. <laughs> so that's like that's like Same close. Thing. I don't think I'm gonna watch Ted Bundy tapes. Maybe the abducted in plain sight because it's like so um, captivating to like you know people I sh- share social media audience with you know like it's hard to not be drawn in when you see people you respect and and follow tweeting about it and well they're addicting like last night I had the Blazers game up on my laptop and Ted Bundy on the TV I had to, I couldn't turn <laughs> either of them screens, off I know. <laughs> that's another uh, thing that I can't stop doing is multiple screens like I will be on the computer but I have to have the TV on. And I might even have my AirPods in, humble brag, AirPods, <laughs> oh uh, listening to a podcast or something. Like sometimes I go three streams of like content coming at me. It's, it's and yet we come to work and we have a million TVs on all the time. So exactly. you would think we wouldn't want that, but exactly. Yeah. So I'm not watching hoops. Definitely check out all of the true crime. And I mentioned everyone's inside because it's so cold out. Today's actually not that bad. It's like it's in like the a 40s. balmy forty. I think it's gonna get back to you know normal winter weather soon. I'm staying but, optimistic. But I gotta say. Something happened to me last night. It's never happened. And I don't know if the heat... Because you mentioned last week the heat in your apartment um, going out during the polar vortex. Yeah, which I, I think it was a little Thoughts bit and prayers, that's terrible. But I don't know if, if something's wrong with the heat in my apartment, but the floor is really cold. And I was walking around last night, and then I finally like got into bed to go, re- go to sleep, and my toes were like frozen. <laughs> like, I could not... They were, they were numb, and I couldn't get feeling back in them. And I'm like... Oh, my God. Like, I didn't have to cut my toes off? Oh Does this ever God. happen to you? No. It hasn't happened to me. But maybe your apartment is playing a cruel trick on you for not saying hello to me on Sunday <laughs> and for not appreciating I mean, Valentine's Day. Okay. <laughs> I literally had to get out of bed last night at, like, 2 in the morning and run my feet under hot water because they're frozen. Me. They're frozen. Now they're they're back. They're fine. But I, I'm a little scared to go home. I don't think I'm going to wear, like, wool socks or hospital socks or something. Well, Alex. Until, until the first flower bl- blooms in the <laughs> spring. So Don't hold your breath for that. Okay. But I hope I hope your war th- picks up in the apartment. Thank you, for, uh, thank you for the kind thoughts. Thanks for, you know, all the content once again on Call for the Culture. Very relevant day with Valentine's Day, so we had some good stuff there. Uh, you know, it is, it is a slow time of year with some, uh, some of the, you know, celeb sightings and 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 hollywood um occurrences but we're grinding through it all-star weekend will give us plenty to talk about i'm sure um the grammys was good and you know i'm sure we'll get back at it next week and i mean obviously we're gonna have to give a lowdown on the rematch between our alma maters that's right monday night so 
we'll see. Maybe Illinois will uh, get a win for the first time in eight years. Uh, yeah, eight years. So you know, it, everything's got to uh, everything's got to come to an end, Colleen. So we'll see. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Well, thank you. Until next time. Yep. Thanks everyone for listening, and uh, talk to you next time on Call for the Culture. All right. One more shout out to Dickie Simpkins and Colleen Degnan for helping out with this episode. Also, shout out to producers Wes White and Julie Bronder who put the show together every week. Appreciate them, and I appreciate everyone out there who is listening. Happy uh, belated Valentine's Day if you're listening to this on Friday. Uh, you know, keep enjoying these Big Ten hoops because we're coming down the home stretch here. Next week, we'll, we'll talk more in depth Big Ten sports with uh, hopefully get Harold Shelton back in here and uh, break down what's going on because things are definitely tightening up, heating up as we get down the stretch. All right, thanks once again to everyone, and we'll talk to you next time here on the Take 10 Podcast.